So I'm just going to uh, get started on our recording here. Um, so uh, we're going to be picking up uh, where we left off with slides. And I want to uh, give us a little bit of a reminder on where we're at, where we were at uh, with respect to uh, this topic, because we're going to be picking up halfway through. And uh, we're going to be continuing on for a specific discussion of networks and different types of networks, uh, both conceptually and as they're reified uh, within any logic. Um, I'm going to switch over to my screen here uh, and uh, resume some of these slides so we saw that we uh, were viewing last time. So uh, specifically, we're talking about this impact of, of context, um, context that's typically traditionally captured through something called the environment within agent-based models. And the idea here is that in agent-based, well, in system dynamics modeling, we were really dealing with emergent behavior of a system, behavior over time that is in no way directly reducible to any one part or just the sum of the parts or the average of the parts. Rather, it's it's generated in, in a fashion that um, transcends any one uh, element. Um, uh, that, that sort of emergence in system dynamics came from interaction of stocks and flows, and particularly through the introduction of mechanisms uh, that were nonlinear in character, as we saw for infectious disease models, where we had this S times I term. Uh, Within any logic, um, uh, we can capture not only those, those uh, system dynamics models, but other types. And we've gone on to agent-based modeling. The focus in agent-based modeling um, has a wide variety of building blocks, as we've talked about. Um, but more notably, um, it's really this characterization of, of agents as interacting that lies at the heart of a lot of emergence for agent-based models. Um, and agent-based models, as I noted last time, emphasize mechanism, context, and outcome. Um, and really what we're talking about is, is context here. And we, I had given a nod to several types of context captured within our previous session. Um, some of these were geographic. Uh, so for example, we might have a, a geographic area and situate agents in it, where certain of those regions, for example, might have uh, better resources associated with them, um, be subject to worse rates of pollution, or or subject to uh, flooding and um, and and natural um, uh, natural exposures. Um, there might be other regions uh, of a city, for example, better served by transportation, such as bus routes. And we can look at the impact of differential access to those resources within a geographic setting, um, as well as, as understand the ways in which the, uh, the agents in turn reciprocally affect that, that area of a city, perhaps through things uh, related, for example, to um, to, to crime or occurrence of, um, of homelessness uh, and, and inability to find shelter, et cetera. Um, within the context of, of models, not only do we have geographic options, but we can associate people with social context. And often this is uh, equipped um, uh, into the model through networks uh, by connecting people into one or more networks. But We'll see to get today in a, an additional way, which it might be captured through through hierarchical nesting of agents, such as an agent within a within a family, for example, or within a school. Um, we can also situate agents within other types of spaces than geography, such as might occur within an indoor space. Uh, and here we're we're typically. Um, placing these agents within to these areas, not just because they are influenced by the area around them, but often because they influence that area. They shed prions that, uh, that contaminate the area and, and may infect other animals, or, or perhaps uh, it's anthrax, uh -huh. as in one of the projects. Was there a, a yeah. comment there? 
thought I heard someone I, speak uh, up. I have some problem with my assignment seven again. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I, it's about I, a comparative. Function I'm sorry. I couldn't make I make that out. Let me get my headphones on. For my search function, compare the coordinates, and I believe. I, I'm sorry. Uh, it came with the code, so I didn't write that comparative function. But it's not working. Um, like it's not working properly. I don't know why. Let me show you. Sorry. Is is that really directed at me? That feels like the 280 or something. Um, yeah, it sounds like 280. I'm pretty sure that's 280. Uh, well, okay, um, so I'm comparing uh, coordinates D1 and D2. Uh, sorry, not comparing. I fascinating. Um, uh, Are we on uh, uh, help desk hours for 280 on Discord at the same time? Between 4 1 and 21. And uh, evidently, uh, could but, someone um, like, Type in the chat that one, uh, there's audio gone. being picked up from someone on, um, is on a help desk people. call or something. And for um, this one as well. Actually, for this one as well. Evidently, so, uh, this individual is not paying yeah, close attention to the lecture is... contents. Let's see if yeah. I can message the 280 Discord. That'll be awesome. Um, yeah. Okay, it sounds like it's been uh, silenced. So um, if it happens again, you can probably mute her by clicking on her um, box and it should um, allow you to mute her as host. Yeah. Okay, let's- uh, Actually, let's... I have another question is in the textbook for a 2D uh, Yes, okay, search... mute. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. It is forever muted. Um, I messaged um, her in gosh. the Discord as well. Okay. Um, Okay, thank, <laughs> thank you. Um, moving right along, um, so uh, we have these agents and they're, they're situated in space. They're influenced by that space. They end up influencing that space. And the space typically affects them through a variety of things, um, through their perception, which affects their decision-making. Um, I think your, what you see on the road ahead affects your braking, for example. Uh, how many people you know around you who have been infected affects your sense of risk for COVID-19 and, and for engaging in social mixing, et cetera. Um, there can be uh, effects of other agents in the environment nearby or effects of directly that environment. For example, the, the ready convenient uh, access to a convenience store right across the street versus a, a food market which offers fresh fruits and vegetables much further away might predispose you to a diet based on Doritos and uh, chips um, and soda rather than um, uh, good, uh, good fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, you might also, by contrast, um, have, have some impact on that environment, whether it's in terms of supporting certain stores, uh, uh, purchases uh, that would support a, um, a healthier set of, of food options or through contamination or through uh, pollution or, or what have you. Um, so these agents are, are typically situated. And last time we looked at um, Conway's game of life as one way the environment might affect an agent. Uh, we had also looked at um, ways in which uh, we might have agents situated in geographic space and be affected by other nearby individuals. Um, now, uh, we had ended our lecture last time with a discussion of mobility. And the idea here is that in addition to being situated, agents often move. And they move uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, to be near other agents, to be in a more preferable place, because they want to uh, stay with the crowd. We saw that in the flock of Boyds. Um, they seek out specific resources like food uh, from a convenience store or a grocery store, et cetera. Um, and mobility can lead to uh, a spread of, um, uh, spread of influence of, of a given agent and influences on that agent that are much broader than if they, than if they stay uh, uh, present in one place. And we can capture that uh, through, in any logic, through this mechanism called move to, which operates both uh, geometrically to move to certain locations and within uh, a geographic space. Uh, so you could say, you know, move to 
Prince Albert and, and the agent uh, could go to, uh, to that particular location in space. Um, and uh, we took a look at a variety of, of uh, models that uh, I made available to you last time. And uh, one thing we didn't talk about is irregular spatial embedding. This is supported in any logic through something called, well, through a couple mechanisms, but uh, traditionally it's through uh, this tradition of process modeling. And uh, a go-to example for this, which I'd invite any of you to make use of, would be uh, what's called the uh, trauma center. So if you go to your uh, any logic help example models and uh, you op open up the example model, uh, which is uh, down here called trauma center, you'll find agents situated in a built environment representing a small hospital. And uh, this is a hospital in, uh, in Oklahoma, it turns out which has a variety of areas associated with it. And you'll notice within this hospital, um, there are a variety of these, um, these uh, linked lines, these linked line segments. Those represent um, uh, paths through which agents uh, can, can move. Uh, they traverse this environment uh, through that network of, of paths and that can link them to different resources, such as uh, their use of these procedure rooms, uh, going to the waiting room and uh, undergoing imaging or what have you um, uh, in this x-ray room. And so they're routed around these paths. And uh, generally this sort of indoor modeling makes use of a style that delineates specific resources. We will be talking more centrally about this form of modeling in the context of our discrete event simulation, uh, which is the next module of the course, I won't dwell as much about it right now, but uh, suffice it to say that this form of simulation is often focused on availability of resources, how long people wait for them, how long the line is for that waiting, what fraction of the time resources are in use, and how many of different resources are needed or how much of a given resource is needed in order to, um, to make the whole system more efficient in terms of not waiting hours for emergency care, et cetera. Uh, and often those are situated in, in spatial environments um, that, are, that are modeled after particular settings. Um, I want though today to, to um, expand our discussion to include networks and networks within um, the context of agent-based modeling are, are twofold in character. One is, is static networks, which are more or less fixed, and one is dynamic networks. And I'd like to look at one of each of these, okay? So um, I invite you to download a model from any logic, um, which, or sorry, from, um, uh, from the Moodle site. Uh, it's a model for any logic, which would allow you to explore the first of these. It, there's a model there called SEIR model illustration. And it may be the last of the models in the example models, uh, model setting uh, shown. Now this model is a model that as, your, as its name uh, indicates is designed to, to characterize an infectious disease. And technically it should be called SEIRS indicating People go through a series of, of stages of infection and then go back to susceptible. Um, now, importantly, compared to uh, the context of models in system dynamics, uh, this model is network mediated and both the occurrence of an infection in a person and their exposure to others is mediated by the network. So, this, in this path from susceptible to exposed, which represents infection of this individual, um, they transit on that, across that path. In other words, they become infected when they receive a message. And this message is received via a network, okay? It's received from neighbors within a network, people to whom they're connected. Now, uh, the flip side of that is, whoever exposes them. And if you go to the infective here, 
you'll find in the infective state with a certain frequency given by the contact rate, this is a certain hazard rate, a certain frequency of occurrence. Um, so they have main dot contact rate uh, occurrences per unit time of this, this uh, transition phi ring. This transition is internally collect, connected from this state to itself, which means they don't leave the state. Um, and it simply goes off and fires again and again. If that connection, this is a, any logic minutia thing, but if that connection were to come out and loop back to the state, uh, they'd technically leave and come back into the state immediately. Here, they're not even leaving the state, but at this contact rate, a certain thing is occurring. And what is that thing? Well, they're sending a message to indicate exposure to infection to a random connected person, someone around them. Now that person may or may not be susceptible. Maybe that person's already infected or maybe they're recovered, in which case that message wouldn't make a difference. Um, but if that person is susceptible, that person would in turn be exposed and become infected. So this, this person is, is exposing other people via a network. And if you scroll up within any logic, again, this is minutiae, you'll find that you can have one or more of these connections. And by adding in additional connections of this sort from the palette, you can add in additional types of networks, a family network, a colleague network, a needle sharing network, a sexual network, uh, et cetera, a social network online. Uh, you can have influences on these different networks. This is the default one, which is always built in. And if a message is received by this network, right now it is forwarded to this state chart here. So uh, these agents are situated and they can get messages in and they can fire off messages via a randomly connect people to whom they're connected via the network. And this is picking one of those pe persons to, to whom to send the message. Now, here I'd like to, to run this model. And in order to do so, I'm gonna run this large population. Uh, and we will see that this model depicts agents situated within these networks. And I'm gonna pause this for a minute here, but um, you'll see here, a set of agents. And uh, some of these agents are in more of a crowded state than other agents. And if you look at the logic behind this model, um, it's actually fairly elegant to do in, in any logic. Within Maine, uh, we have this population. That's the population of agents. This population of agents is given an income, which is randomly distributed according to a certain probability distribution. In this case, a log normal probability distribution with a, a log mean of four and a log standard deviation of two, okay? Um, bear in mind that for a normal distribution, they're in reverse orders, which is bizarro, but um, uh, I've said that probably dozens of times and any logic has never listened. So. So this is their income of a given person is drawn from this distribution, from this log normal distribution. Just like it could be drawn from a, uh, a beta distribution or a log normal uh, uh, here or an exponential. Uh, you wouldn't wanna draw it from a normal distribution because that can go negative and negative incomes are, are not normally, uh, uh, something we want to consider. Um, so we have for each agent, their income being determined through this. That's because each agent has an income parameter. And the value of that income parameter, the assumption for it is specified and communicated at the point of creation, namely in this population agent or this population situated in Maine. Now, the person's location, the placement of that agent is dictated uh, randomly vertically, but it's dictated by their income as long as this uh, param as long as this um, 
flag is on. This is crowded income based. So we situate them at a location according to their assigned income. Um, otherwise, we we locate them at a at a at a draw from a uniform distribution between zero and the width of the space. So so that's why we see these agents spread out. These are higher income agents over here, higher income meaning further to the to the right, further high value of x. These are lower income agents. And lower income agents, by virtue of being squeezed into these areas, are disproportionately crowded. Um, these agents are situated in these networks. And that network, and I'm feeding you information that will help on your problem set three here, that network characteristic is dictated by main as well down in the space and network area where you can set a user-defined layout. That's because they were, we said we wanted them to be located with income. And they're wired up on a distance-based network. So any two individuals will be connected if they lie within 75 units of distance of each other. Um, and it turns out that um, uh, with a thousand population, you get this sort of uh, level of packing where most people are, are situated except a few high income people. So if you run this uh, model, um, there's an infection spread over the network. And um, do you think, I mean, given what you see here, what would you expect about infections in lower income individuals versus higher income individuals? Based It'd on be, what I've told you and what you see. Right. What's that? Be ramp, rampant in the lower income? Yeah, it's going to be rampant in lower income. And you know, if we uh, continue to run this, you'll you can scroll up here, and I will put this on virtual mode to run this um, uh, more more quickly here. But uh, what you will find is, um, and uh, okay, it's 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 going a bit slowly, but here it's ramping up. Um, you will find that uh, in uh, in lower income individuals, uh, you have higher numbers of, of infections than in, um, in uh, higher income individuals. This, this histogram is actually showing connection counts to how many people they're connected on average. Disproportionately low income is connected with more people than high income. And there are some high income individuals almost connected with, with uh, none. But in terms of infection counts, we also have a disproportionate burden in, um, in the low income group. Uh, the high income group does include some people with substantial numbers of infections, but lower income has virtually everyone, you know, having significant numbers of, of infections cumulatively. Whereas the high income group has some individuals with very, very low and others with tailing numbers of infections. And if you go look at the state space involved in this, what you will find is that um, the, the uh, low SES and the high SES have this, um, this real separation where the high SES people uh, have a larger number of susceptibles, that's the x-axis, um, uh, than do the, um, the, the, uh, the lower income individuals here. The lower income individuals have fewer remaining, um, fewer remaining uh, susceptibles. Now, the two populations are of somewhat different size, so be, be cautious about um, uh, about comparing them directly. Now, here's another glimpse of this model, though taking advantage of the individual based lens here. So each dot here represents a particular person. And what we're graphing on the X axis is their income. And on the Y axis, the number of infections they've suffered. Okay. Um, and Generally speaking, what is this graph telling us? Can anyone say? I mean, the fact that we see this kind of curve here, each dot is a person, and the location of that person, x-axis again, is, is income, y-axis is number of infections they've suffered. What is this telling us? Uh, the higher the income, the lesser the infections. Yeah. 
generally speaking, um, the higher the income, as you go up in income, you tend to have somewhat fewer infections that a person has suffered. Um, and at some point it kind of drops off almost entirely, right? These are a bunch of wealthy individuals who can shut themselves away for a year and uh, not be infected, right? Uh, and here's individuals living in crowded dorms, crowded tenements, essential workers. Um, they have to demand, you know, uh, city services, et cetera. And there's higher number of infections. Now, this curve, of course, was not pre-programmed in. This emerged from these networks that we have down here and the gradient of income, you know, uh, with reference to those networks. Uh, it emerged, whoa, from, from this, uh, this whole cacophony of interactions. Uh, but it's a sobering curve in terms of the impact of income on exposure to infection. Um, and it's not something you would see directly if you weren't breaking out income in this way, right? If you were just looking at the prevalence of infection for the, uh, the model as a whole. But uh, it ends up uh, coming out as an emergent, uh, emergent property. Um, okay, I'm going to um, uh, just note that uh, this sort of model uh, illustrates a, well, I guess we'll stop it. You've seen enough there. Uh, it illustrates a static network. The network's not changing. There's no alteration over time to whom a, per, a given person is connected. Uh, it's, it's static and it's based on their neighbors and income space. And it's still a useful construct. It shows uh, principles associated with social determinants of health, way, ways in which that person might be affected by their particular social circumstance or their uh, housing, for example, whether it's crowded or not, just as that model with GIS space could, could communicate other social determinants of health, but in a lens that's more dynamic than is typically associated with use of that term, social determinants of health, which traditionally is, is often used um, in more of an associational context with statistics. Um, so here we're understanding why, what mechanisms give rise to these disparities we see. Let's go look though at a model where we do have change in network connections. This is another aspect of, you could say mobility in the sense people are moving around or people are electing to shape to whom they're connected. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna open another model from the set that I gave you. And it's one that's called um, uh, ABM with, uh, with birth death, okay? ABM model with birth death. Um, and this one is gonna illustrate connections that are made and broken over time. It's, it's here mostly uh, uh, creating that will be obvious, but there's breaking that will occur when an individual dies as well. This is not so much elective changing of, um, of connections, but rather when um, a new family is joined by a, a, a new child, a family is joined by a new child, uh, connections are, are introduced into that family. So here we have a set of agents. The agent's age is indicated by the, the radius associated with a given circle. So a circle represents a given agent. And you notice that circles appear and then grow in kind of a, um, a fashion that uh, that can be quite quick if you're if you're running it uh, rapidly. But when they first are introduced, there that represents a child, and it ends up growing. Um, it becomes full size at a certain um, uh, sort of an adult size, and it persists. And when babies are born, they are wired into the family um, that uh, that gave rise to them, and so. Uh, they joined the family network, as it were. Uh, and over time, uh, they carry the connections of their parents, therefore. When an individual drops, um, the network connections to them are, are, are dropped. So this is an example of a changing network, a network which is alternating over time. Um, you might think of other changing networks associated with changes of sexual partners for sexually transmitted in disease, of diseases or 
changes associated with moving from one apartment to the other in terms of, of your, uh, your connections. So static networks uh, are used in many agent-based models. Dynamic uh, networks are also very popular. And um, in some cases, it represents physical movement. In other cases, it represents just different preferences for dealing with people. Um, uh, for example, different business transactions going on at any one time or different uh, affiliation of who you spend time around. Um, so uh, within this context, uh, changes of networks are another way you can get kind of uh, changes that end up impacting the individual in different ways over time, much as if they pick up and move in geographic space. Okay, uh, another common model you see within ABMs has to do with lending context through hierarchical nesting. And there's really two ways this takes place. One is um, physical containment. So you have a person who is physically in an environment at a given time. Um, so they're in a workplace right now, or they're at a home, for example. Um, they're in a school. Uh, and this is physically uh, as such. Another is a logical containment, you know, so a person belongs to a civic club or belongs to a family. They belong to a professional body. And they may not be in the presence of them at all time, but they are um, a member that is affected by that, that family. And often they will spend, uh, spend time with it. Um, and so these are ways that we get affected by our environment and we affect our environment. Winston Churchill once said, we build our buildings and then our buildings build us. And so it is with, with these other aspects of environment, um, social environment, uh, organizational environment, et cetera. Um, and one of the powerful things about agent-based modeling is its capacity to represent this nesting of sorts so as to capture this kind of hierarchy of influence uh, in which people are based. And I'd like to look at an example. There's something called, a model that I provided you called hierarchical infection transmission V8. Um, it's quite a mouthful, but um, I'd like you to go and find it and open it here. Um, and I will do the same. So. This is a, a, a model which is going to show individuals um, nested within cities, okay? Um, it's not the only such uh, model. There's also one of environmental contamination that um, you glimpsed last time, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, this one shows it in a particularly evocative fashion because we have uh, a hierarchy of, of, um, love, of um, context captured by the entire model. Cities, which are situated in space and linked together in a network, uh, they'll be indicated with, um, with squares and persons within cities indicated with a small icon here who are who, are, who live at any one time in a given city. And like a lot of these models, this is an infection spread model. Uh, so um, people are susceptible, they move to exposed, uh, infectious and recovered. We actually built this model interactively in an hour or two with a public health agency of Canada as part of an event I was leading for them on this sort of modeling back in 2015. And uh, this is a model which has waning of immunity, which means that the infection can, can keep on going. It doesn't just burn out and die off like a fire in your fireplace with all the fuel exhausted or with most of the fuel exhausted. Uh, like the past model, people are exposed to infection, but unlike the past model, they have a certain probability of getting infected according to a transmission probability, okay? And uh, this indicates that branching indicates a conditional transition here. If they're not infected, they just go back to susceptible where they remain. 
uh, some initial person can also be forced to be infected at the start to um, in order to get them to to uh, be seated within the model. Now, this model um, uh, has has these multiple cities. They're placed at random locations, and sometimes those locations can be um, placed uh, fortuitously, spread out, and sometimes not. Here, they're they're not very well spread out. But what you'll see is individuals within each of these cities who are in a variety of infection statuses indicated by their color. And uh, the infection will start with one individual or one city, but it will propagate. And it propagates most notably within that city because they're situated in the networks uh, within purely within a city. But that individual can move between cities. So at any one time, we have a city has a population here, um, and that city population is composed of people. Um, and so a person, each person will be located, excuse me, will be located within a given city. So if we got a person here, you'll find, uh, you scroll up, this indicates kind of the city. So you could always say, what's my city? You know, this dot city, if you're referring to the person um, in Java code. And the city is the city in which they're currently affiliated. But what you'll find is that periodically, according to an event um, that fires, you may recall events being covered in a past lecture, on a certain per day rate given by a migration rate, this person picks up and leaves and they go to a different city. Um, so they get a, a, a randomly, a city that's connected to their city. So it's one hop away. Um, they pick a random one of those cities and then they join that population. So they go and they plop over to that population. They shift populations. Um, and uh, this makes all the difference for infection spread. Because without that, infection would spread within a city, right? They'd, they'd be infecting their neighbors and their network, all of whom are in the same city. It's by virtue of their migration that they might bring that infection to another place, right? By virtue of that, that someone from Wuhan, China came to British Columbia within uh, Canada or uh, that one actually didn't take off uh, widely, but but those from Europe or Iran came came over um, from Italy and and from various places in Europe and and carried uh, infection into North America, and uh, and it could then spread um, spread because of that. Uh, if you've ever thought about it, planes are like they're they're like hypodermic needles that kind of go and and inject people into a new environment uh, who could be infected and, and they circulate in the environment in ways that can concede infection. What determines whether it takes off is, is a more critical thing. If you have an environment where um, the basic reproductive number is less than one, you know that's gonna be small potato, potatoes. But uh, if it's greater than one, that initial person is, is, is not the big issue. It's the fact that the, the effective reproductive number is greater than one will allow it to spread really widely. And it's just a matter of time. Um, shutting borders buys time, basically. Um, so here you have, um, you have people who can move between cities. And by virtue of going between cities, they can carry the infection between the cities uh, and spread it in, in a new city. And so that's what's occurred here. Uh, the person may start in one city infected, um, but it moves to other cities eventually through migration. Now, something you'll find from this model and from the last, if you run it uh, a number of times, is that the infection doesn't always catch. It, it isn't always the case that it starts to spread. And, there's good reason for this. And it stands in contrast to a, to a system dynamics model. In system dynamics models, we were dealing with deterministic models traditionally. 
Um, and if the basic reproductive number at the beginning is greater than one, it's going to be spread. Uh, if it's less than one, it's going to peter out. Uh, enough said. In this context, there's stochastics. So you might have one person initially affected for sure, initially starting infective, but whether it catches when they send messages to their neighbors and each neighbor has just a certain probability of getting infected is another matter. Um, it may not catch um, and they may end up essentially dying out as the only person who's ever infective and the population is spared an outbreak. But, you know, uh, chances are most likely it will spread. It's just some number of runs, you'll find it, it doesn't spread. And if you run it again and again and again, because this, this um, scenario is associated, if you scroll down, I'm giving you lots of things to think about in your assignment with a random seed. Be sure to check that. You're not running it every time with the same fixed seed. Be sure to do it with a random seed. So each time it's different. Um, you will get different outcomes for each one. If you run it with a fixed seed, maybe you'll be lucky enough to have a fixed or unlucky enough to have a fixed seed where it never catches. And you'll think something's wrong with your model. It's actually just the luck of the draw. So here the infection has started, but you'll notice due to migration, it's already moved here. Now it's moved here. No one here up. Oh, now, now there's a uh, recovered person who moved there, but nothing yet. It's starting up here. This is like Australia and New Zealand. Um, they, uh, they haven't yet been infected uh, and will they? Ah, okay, so now a few people are getting it and alas, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the infection is spread now to all cities. So this is an example of a hierarchical model. We have people arranged in a logical hierarchy that reflects a nesting in the world, right? People within cities and then cities within the entire region. Um, we can layer this in at, at additional levels, uh, but it's capturing this phenomenon that we mentioned of hierarchical nesting. And hierarchical nesting is often useful for capturing more permanent structures, things like family context, for example, or neighborhood context where the the, the time frame of the model is is low, uh, is short. Um, and you might want to capture this because there might be dynamics at different levels. Um, maybe there's certain things that occur in the context of a school, for example, screening kids for infection or long-term care facility, um, doing periodic checks with uh, with antigen tests or with, uh, with in fact, nasopharyngeal for for uh, some individuals uh, swabbing um, that, that might go on. And uh, you can capture those processes operating by, by capturing the, the context as an agent. So you have, you know, in this context um, that we just looked at, city is more of a passive thing. It's kind of a container. But in general, it might be something which, um, has, has uh, actions taking place. And even here, there's an intervention one where a particular city may undertake an intervention that's specific to it. Um, so that's, that's one reason to capture these. Another is you might summarize the dynamics at the city level, like how many people are sick in a given city uh, on a per city basis. Um, uh, you might visualize it in a different way as we have. Um, you might capture different relevant contexts into these different levels. You parcel out what it's a city effect, a neighborhood effect, a family effect from other things. And you can often compare these against statistics, which are computed, say, for a classroom, for each person, for a classroom, for a school, for a school system, for the whole country or what have you. Um, okay, so we've uh, we've seen a model like that. All of these are ways of capturing context and environments. But there's one particular sort of context we're going to be spending more time covering, and that has to do with this this use of networks. Okay, and and 
the, the, the unique features of networks. And it's to that we're going to next, next transition. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, for a moment, stop the recording so that we